Learn more about finding your family history by visiting the Ancestors website, where you can download pedigree charts, access online databases, and explore the ins and outs of genealogical records. The Ancestors Research Kit, Tools for Discovering Your Family History, is now available. The kit guides users through the family history research process and includes instructional videotapes, the Ancestors Guidebook, and key genealogical forms. To order, call 1-800-758-0846. A series companion book, In Search of Our Ancestors, is also available. Funding for the Ancestors series is made possible by a grant from the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation, proud to support the worldwide effort to bring families together, and by AncestralQuest.com, helping families find their lost ancestors for over 50 years. AncestralQuest.com. Welcome to Ancestors. I'm your host, Scott Wilkinson. Today we're going to explore newspapers, the big time and small town periodicals that captured events as they occurred. And while we all remember exciting front page banners, the most important headlines in your genealogy are most likely the ones tucked between the sports and the want ads, where the day to day happenings of your ancestors were printed, published, and delivered to America's front door. Newspapers, in my opinion, are one of the most valuable sources of information for the genealogist and it's interesting because oftentimes they won't make the top three list or the top two list of sources because everyone is pretty fixed on you know the vital and the census and the military but newspapers are so consequential to doing research because we sometimes forget the context in which most newspapers have existed historically and that is they are the chronicle of the life and the times of the people and the organizations in a particular community. Lori Davis from Anaheim Hills, California, was introduced to newspapers while trying to research her grandfather and his mother, Dorothy Hamill, who Lori would eventually read about on the faded front pages of the San Francisco Chronicle. And she discovered a fascinating world of high fashion and scandal she never would have believed possible if she hadn't seen it in print. When I first started filling out my pedigree chart, it was, it was a sad sight. I really didn't have very much information past my grandparents, and I wanted to know about them. I wanted to know where they came from. When I thought back, that's really sad that I don't even know where my grandparents were born and where their parents came from. My grandmother gave me a copy of a photograph of my grandfather as a young child standing with his father and his grandfather. And that was maybe the first time that I had ever thought about my grandparents having parents and grandparents. The thought just never occurred to me. There was something special about my grandfather. He um, had a sense of class like no one else that I knew. He would say, use terms that were unusual. He would call my grandmother Eleanor Jane Ma'am and would say, oh, you look very spiffy this morning and things like that. Things that, you know, no one else in the neighborhood would say. His manners were just, you know, just so and everything about him was very proper. And it always made me think, where did this come from? I was always curious. After he died, I thought, you know, it's, it's time. I should ask, and I should really get into this and, um, and see if I can find out more about him. I made that a priority to try and fill in some of those gaps. But my big hitch was my great-grandmother. I couldn't get past her. I couldn't document her. So that's what I'm trying to do now.
Don't use as an excuse the thought that, oh, it's all been destroyed, what's the point? No, you go out there and you look and you will find things. And if you're serious about finding it, by golly, you won't leave a stone unturned. And if you don't find one thing, you'll find a substitute for that thing. The first information that I started um, to acquire was vital records. I started writing away for birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates. When I received my grandfather's parents' marriage certificate, it listed his mother's mother, Alicia Homans, and the fact that she was born in South America. So I went to an online genealogy site and started entering information. I actually found it on this site and it listed the birthplace as South America. And so we probably had a match. When I finally made contact with the submitter of the information, she said that her, her mother um, worked for my great-grandmother, Dorothy, and um, wasn't real fond of her in later years. And she thought that possibly uh, my great-grandmother might have been in some kind of trouble in the 30s or, or late 20s. And she suggested that, um, that I check in the San Francisco newspapers. Some things you will only find within newspapers, you won't find anywhere else. And they chronicled uh, local areas at every given day. Of course, some newspapers were weekly, uh, but many newspapers were daily. And they had to get stories and, and write about the daily lives of, of individuals. We get really fixed on our current perception of things. We, we say, well, the newspaper today, well, they get a lot of stuff off the AP, wire, they get a lot of national news, local news. There's really not much family news in there. I think that's probably a misperception. If we look for it, we can find more family news than we think. But more importantly, contemporary newspapers don't at all look like the newspapers of yesterday. There's a tremendous amount of data in newspapers of yesterday and yesteryear. Newspapers are often overlooked as a source of family history information, but they can be a valuable tool in your research. The challenge is locating and identifying the right newspaper for your particular search. And so in a way, doing newspaper research is as easy or easier than any other type of research because if you have an ancestor that lived in an organized community, a town, a city, uh, even a county that may be outside of the town, there's a very, very good likelihood that early on in the existence of that particular organized community, that town, that city, that county, that a newspaper will have existed and some form of daily, weekly, bi-weekly publication will continue to exist from close to the founding of that town to the present day. So what's the, what's the trick? What's the best way to begin to access newspapers? Find a geographic area where your ancestor lived and identify a time period where he or she lived there and bingo, you're right there. If you're researching a particular person, you'll of course want to know their name and the place where they lived. And then you will have needed to look at a map and know perhaps what the county seat was or what the next biggest town was that might have had a newspaper. If you can't find the name of the town your ancestors are from, it's not that they were wrong in the spelling of it and you weren't silly and made a mistake. It either doesn't exist anymore or they changed the name of the town. And there are ways you can find that out. You can go to a gazetteer, which lists localities. You can go to directories, which again list localities, especially contemporary directories, you know, the time that your ancestors were there. And then you can go to the county histories and find out, ah, dry diggings is now Placerville. Often people are looking for place names in the United States that don't exist anymore. It's a small town, it was a postal village at one point in time and it only existed for a few years. We can often find these places through using various gazetteers that we have, that, which is a listing of places in a town. And we have quite a good collection for um, the early to mid 1800s for many states in the United States. And these will give you a description of the town, tell you where it is. Usually we can find them on a map then, but not always. But for most places we can then look at a modern map and find where it is even if it's not on the map based on comparing the old map with the new map. 
Once you've located the town where your ancestors lived, you're ready to look for newspapers. And they're not as difficult to find as you might think. The neat thing about newspapers is most every single public library feels a responsibility to collect and preserve the newspapers for its city and its county. So not only do you immediately have a newspaper, but you immediately have a first best place to check. Aha, the local public library. The second great place that I think a lot of genealogists sometimes just forget about. It's one of those things that's right in front of you, so you, you oftentimes don't see it. Most state libraries have almost complete collections of newspapers for the entire state in which they reside. And the beauty of that is most state libraries still participate in interlibrary loan. So if I'm here in Missouri or I'm here in Walla Walla, Washington doing research on a family that's back in Albany, New York or in Portland, Maine or in Tallahassee, Florida, I can contact, I can identify the town, find the name of the paper that was extant during that time period. I can contact through my local library the Florida State Library, the likelihood that they will loan me the microfilm roll that contains that paper and that date is very high, very, very high. Three standard reference works that will help the beginning newspaper researcher are Brigham's Directory, Gregory's Directory, and Ayer's Directory. And Brigham's Index tells you what town had a paper before 1820 and what copies of that paper are still existing and what libraries own them. Winifred Gregory's directory picks up where Brigham left off in 1821 through 1936, doing the same thing. Ayers directory tells you what media were published in what state, city, and town throughout the U.S. When it comes to using uh, newspaper websites on the internet, you don't find a lot of historical information about uh, uh, newspapers on the internet. That's maybe one of the areas that it falls short. What you can find are libraries and archives that have collections of newspapers. And you can learn where these collections exist, how to access them, maybe even how to get some of this information through interlibrary loan. One day my husband um, took a day off of work and he said, what would you like to do today? And I said, let's go to Los Angeles Public Library. They have this great genealogy floor. And so we went in and then I thought, you know, while I'm here, I'll gather up enough nerve to go to the counter and ask them if by any chance they have any San Francisco newspaper information. And I thought that was an odd question to ask, but I did it anyways. And they said, oh yeah, we have the index for um, San Francisco newspapers over here on microfiche. A lot of your local public libraries will create indexes to parts of the newspapers, portions of the newspapers, the obituary portion, maybe the birth, death, and marriage portion. Uh, maybe the events, the major events. Typically they won't do every name, every event indexing, but your public library will keep the paper and will begin to provide some access to events and people. I looked for the last name of Hamill on the index and I didn't find anything for Dorothy Hamill. Nothing at all. But there was just loads of entries for a Barbette Hamill. I've n I never heard that name Barbette before. But I thought, since we're here, I might as well order a couple of the films and take a look at them. Lori was able to find a lot of information using newspaper indexes, but we can't all expect to have such instant success. Most newspaper indexes only include the names of people extracted from major articles. You'll need to scroll through the entire newspaper, usually on microfilm, to find an ancestor's name. That's why pinpointing the date you're looking for is so important. It'll narrow the search, plus save you quite a bit of time. So I received the first roll of microfilm for the San Francisco Chronicle, and I put it in, and I, I found that the first entry went to the page, and it showed a picture of a stunning-looking woman with, with fur and, and a hat on, and it said, Beauty Flees San Francisco Fraud Net. Barbette Hamill wanted on jewel theft warrant. And I thought, wouldn't that be something if it was her? And so we continued looking through the microfilm and we found the next one and then the next and it got more exciting and but I still thought, no, it couldn't be her. Until I found an article that listed my great grandfather's name, Guy Hamill. And that's an unusual name, so I knew. And then another article listing her mother as Alicia Homans. I knew at this point that Barbette Hamill was my great-grandmother, that she just went by a different name. 
What do you do when you find some information that doesn't fit? Most families aren't perfect. Uh, it, it's interesting, you can take any social issue, from drug abuse, to prostitution, to murder, to stealing, to fraud. You can go back 75 years, and you can find the same thing happening. You can go back into the 19th century and find the same thing happening. And there's really not a whole lot of vice that is new. Sometimes we think we've got a corner on the market and this is the most decadent age we've lived in. But again, all you have to do is look at newspapers and see, wow, these kind of things were going on. Tax fraud was going on. Uh, politicians who were less than honest, <laughs> those things were going on. Once we begin to set the context of, I want factual information because that will provide me with data about my family. Once we really stick to that, um, we're into less of a a game of good and evil and making my family seem like the upright all-American family, um, th then we can really appreciate that even the facts that are less than flattering by contemporary standards um, can provide us with meaningful information. As I went through the newspaper articles, I saw different names that she went by. A Mrs. M.C. Wade, a Dorothy White, a Mrs. Whipple, I saw the picture in the newspaper of my grandfather as a small child. He had a, a little hat on, uh, it looked like a, a, like a gentleman's hat, uh, uh, and he had this kitten that he was cuddling and it just put together, you know, that this is, this is family and that really was him and just how, how adorable he looked and that he was a little boy and, and I got to have a picture of him as a small child. That I, that I would have missed. What we want to do is we want to have data about birth to death of every single one of our ancestors. That's, that's the best genealogy. That's where we get the story. That's where we really get a family history as opposed to a genealogy. There's a difference between being a researcher and a collector. And I think if you're going to be a collector, yeah, you're going to go after the easy records. You're going to go after things that are indexed and not worry about the things that aren't indexed. And you're going to be a collector of dead relatives. And if you're going to be a researcher, you know, you're going to try to go after everything. You're going to try to find the family, and you're going to find out what they did, because every single life event has the possibility of giving us a little piece of information that will help us get back one more generation. I received from my mother-in-law a copy of my father-in-law's death notice and obituary from the newspaper. And upon reading it, my husband, who also didn't know this, realized that his father had won six battle stars in World War II and several other medals. And when my husband read it, he was like, where did this come from? And he's, his mother had given the information, but it was not something he ever knew. And we've now applied for those medals because he's never, he never got them. He got the certificates. And so he died almost three years ago, and my children will now have his medals because of this obituary, which I thought I knew everything about the man, but obviously I didn't. <laughs> An obituary is a news story written about the person by someone else after they have died. It'll tell you where the person was born and when, the names of their parents, where they went to school, what they did for a living, and where they retired to. Don't expect to find an obituary notice like the ones we write today in papers of the early 20th century or the 19th century. You're not going to find that kind of detailed information, but you might find something. I was looking for an ancestor in the 1790s, and in the Virginia Gazette, I found a one-line notice that said the, the lady died in July 22, 1790, in Alexandria, Virginia. After the initial shock of finding the first group of articles, um, I decided that I wanted to find out as much and everything that I could about her. And when I started looking at them from, from a distance, not so close, I thought, wow, isn't this great? And almost every article is front page material. Who was this woman? They referred to her only in a lot of articles as Barbette. So, you know, she was a high society con woman, I guess. I was able to get a sense of, of the kind of person that she was. Um, and I also had pictures of someone that no one had ever seen, or no one that I knew had ever seen, none of my relatives. So it was very special. And I could tell by looking at the pictures that she was a very beautiful woman. 
that she was classy and wore beautiful gowns and she knew the right kind of people. And every time I thought about that, I also thought about my grandfather and being exposed to, to people of wealth and, and then I started clicking back and saying, oh, this is where this came from. This is, this is why he was so proper. This is where he got that um, exposure. Using newspapers as a way of stepping into the shoes of your ancestor to know what was going on in, in that particular community. Newspapers to me are, are an absolutely wonderful way to put the meat on the bones of your ancestors' lives. The last article that I found was in March of 1947. Will you ever forget Barbette Hamill? Now there is a, a woman, woman with, with chic, chic dash, dash, and imagination to say nothing of larceny. There was nothing Bush League about Barbette. Big or small, she built them all. The cops called her the cleverest confidence woman to work here in years. The newspapers couldn't make up their minds whether she was Lady Wallingford, the Siren of Swindle, or the female Ponzi. A jury in Superior Court eventually decided she was just plain guilty. Pretty Barbette entered San Quentin with a flourish worthy of Hildegard. She looked around and said, it's such a lovely old place. Yes, whatever happened to Barbette Hamill. Anytime you have a brush with the law, it creates a, the possibility, at least, of a number of records. If you are arrested, there should be, or if there's a warrant taken out on your arrest, even before you're arrested, there's one record. Your arrest may generate uh, a record in a jail register. You being boarded in a jail for a particular time may generate yet more entries in that jail register. Bringing brought to court, uh, pleadings and proceedings in court dockets, those are more records. Um, so any type of event that generates a record, and that's literally almost any type of event, those are events that we need to be interested in. You can use uh, court records in conjunction with newspapers uh, to go backward through the court records and find out what there is uh, about that case in the court records. Once I knew that she went to prison, and through the newspapers I was able to find out what courthouse she, um, her trial was, was at. From that, I sent away for the court records. They interviewed her, my great-grandmother in the court transcripts and it asked where she was born, what her father's name is, what her mother's name, had she ever been in an accident, had she had any operations, and it really gave a, another insight into this woman. When you have the opportunity to work with the records and, and look at them as a whole, um, there are so many parts of them that give you detail about the people that were involved that they uh, become exciting and they're, they're interesting places to look. We don't have to explain them, we don't have to justify them, we don't have to feel any yoke of responsibility that they happened, uh, but we should benefit from the information that they can provide us. There are at least two things you need for success in newspaper research, luck and cussedness. You need to be lucky in finding that your ancestor was reported on, and you need to be persistent enough to crank that microfilm through the reel, page by page, image by image, looking and reading and searching for what you want to find. Newspapers contain so many names and so many stories. There's a good chance your ancestors are recorded in some of them. And when you actually find a newspaper that talks about your ancestor, it opens up their world to you. And that's what it's all about, discovering your family and connecting with your ancestors. Through my research, I was able to maybe find out why my grandfather became the kind of man that he did. He was a very special person. He cared about everyone and made sure that everyone was taken care of. And then I thought, who took care of him? And is that why he was so caring? Was there someone in his life that made sure that he was taken care of or was he left to fend for himself and he didn't want that to happen to anyone else? Yes, I wish that I could sit down with him today and ask him and, and know all these questions where, you know, he has the answers or he had the answers and no one inquired. And, you know, that just proves a point how important it is to ask your family now. Don't wait. 
next time on Ancestors. For Bruce and Mary Kay Stewart, there's only one way to do genealogy, hit the road. After transforming their RV into a traveling research center, they would stop at a courthouse in upstate New York and find the will of Bruce's third great-grandfather. And that was only the beginning. It listed every one of his children. I mean, just all of these people were listed with their mailing addresses, what's more. Oh, my God.